Good afternoon. I'm James Stewart, and I'm director of the Princeton University Art Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome so many of you uh, today. As uh, many of you will know, the Princeton University Art Museum has one of the finest teaching collections of photography in the United States, now numbering over 34,000 works of art. Among these are three archives <clears throat> devoted to individual artists who substantially impacted the course of the history of photography. The earliest of these is devoted to the work of Clarence H. White, and we thank our stalwart friend and emeritus colleague, Peter Bennell, for securing that archive for Princeton many years ago. But it has taken the work of our speaker this afternoon, Professor Anne McCauley, to understand and more fully exploit the significance of this archive. The exhibition we celebrate this afternoon, Clarence H. White and His World, The Art and Craft of Photography, 1895 to 1925, is the result, and it reclaims for White an important role in the history of photography as both maker and teacher. So let me say a few words about our speaker and exhibition guest curator, Anne McCauley. Anne is, since 2002, David Hunter McAlpin, professor of the history of photography and modern art, in Princeton's Department of Art and Archaeology. Incidentally, I should say that the chair she occupies was the first in the United States devoted to the history of photography. She received a BA from Wellesley College and a PhD from Yale University, where she was one of the first art history graduate students to write a dissertation on the history of photography. Prior to coming to Princeton 15 years ago, she taught successiv uh, successively at the University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Anne's work has addressed the economic, scientific, and political contexts for the intervention, sorry, the invention, and commercial development of photography as a mass medium in the 19th century. The institutional frameworks for photographic exhibition and collecting, and the rise of American modernist photography in the progressive era. Among her many publications are Industrial Madness, Commercial Photography in Paris, 1848 to 1871, published in 1994, The Museum and the Photograph, co-authored with Mark Howarth Booth in 1998, Gondola Days, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner and the Palazzo Barbaro Circle in 2004, an exhibition that she co-curated uh, at the Gardner Museum in Boston, and Alfred Stieglitz and the Steerage, co-authored with Jason Francisco in 2012. Anne has also been a Guggenheim Fellow and a J. Paul Getty Museum Guest Scholar, as well as being an Honorary Fellow of the Royal Photographic Society in the UK. Anne's interest in Clarence White grew out of earlier research on Edward Steichen and Alfred Stieglitz, but was particularly inspired by her arrival at Princeton and subsequent exploration of the large archive of white prints, negatives, and manuscript materials held in our museum. After this exhibition, um, which after Princeton, she'll travel to the Davis Museum at Wellesley College, the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, and the Cleveland Museum of Art, and hopes to return to a large book project on American modernist photography during World War I. Inevitably, projects of this kind require the generosity of many, and I won't take the time here to thank the full roster of lenders and donors, uh, in part because I shall have the occasion to do so later tonight. For now, let me thank, among our lenders, the Library of Congress, which is home, along with Princeton, to the other most substantial body of material by Clarence White. And among our donors, I want to thank here the Henry Luce Foundation, uh, our lead sponsor, and the Barfari Foundation Fund for Publications in the Department of Art and Archaeology. I hope all of you will join us in the museum for a reception immediately following this talk, including a chance to view the exhibition. But for now, please join me in thanking and welcoming Anne McCauley. It's really a pleasure to introduce you to the work of Clarence White. This has been a long time coming, I think, for all of us, particularly me, but for all of the museum staff. And I would really like to thank James Stewart for making this complicated project possible. Um, I'm an academic normally, and I'm used to working alone. Um, and it was something of a shock for me to find out that 
so many people would do things for me. I've, I've never really experienced this. And so um, being with the Princeton staff was fantastic in the museum. Um, I would like to thank uh, particularly uh, the photo curator, Kate Bussard, who was the project manager for this, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. Um, also uh, in the museum staff, Mike Jacobs, uh, who is the preparator, who had an incredible crew that put this on the walls in a week. Uh, designer Clayton Vogel, I don't know if he's here. Uh, the registrar, Liz Aldred. Catherine Goodwin and her team, who handled all of the digital component. And when you go in the show, you're going to see that we um, digitally reproduced the class albums of Clarence White to allow people for the first time to have access to what the students produced and gave to him as, a, as gift albums. And she, their, their team um, made that possible on a monitor. Um, I would also like the people to thank the people involved in the publication. The catalog was itself a major um, production. Anna Brower was my editor, and we really spent thousands of hours uh, working on this catalog, and I think um, it turned out to be extremely beautiful, so I hope you will look at it. I do not get any royalties off of this, so this is, this is not a, a plug for me. Um, I, too, would also like to thank the lenders, uh, particularly the uh, great-granddaughters of a man named Stephen Reynolds, who was introduced in this exhibition, who was an extremely good friend of White, a hero of White, and whose family in Terre Haute, Indiana, was the subject of countless beautiful photographs that you will see in the section in this exhibition devoted to American socialism and Clarence White. The exhibition and research, the research that went to it, um, for the first time, as James said, brought together two major archives of white material, um, one of which was uh, given and acquired by the Library of Congress through the uh, descendants of the middle son of Clarence White, Maynard White, and I, don't, I haven't yet met them. I hope they're in the audience, and I want to thank them for making this material available. I did work with the curator at the Library of Congress, Verna Curtis, uh, again, who was really uh, an important uh, contributor to this project, and she is here, so thank you, Verna. I also would like to end with a kind of homage to Peter Bennell, because obviously if Peter Bennell had not gotten this material through the youngest son of Clarence White, Clarence White Jr., that's the material that came into Princeton, and if he had not acquired that, we certainly would not have anything to put together in this exhibition. Peter shared with me his um, his own personal archives, which are extensive, and he also shared his memories of Clarence White Jr., with whom he studied photography, um, studio photography at Ohio University, and who later became uh, a very close friend of, of Peter's. So let's now turn to this rather enigmatic and uh, a little bit forgotten figure. In an obituary following his premature death in Mexico City in 1925, at the age of 54, Clarice Hudson White was declared, quote, one of America's most gifted photographers, and perhaps the one whose work will have the most permanent effect upon the younger generation, unquote. So on what grounds was this claim made, and why should we pay attention to him today? And here you're seeing him on the screen, on the left, this is a photograph by a friend of his uh, at a young age, and then on the right is a portrait of his family by uh, Gertrude Kasebeer. These questions, why should we pay attention to White? These were some of the questions that inspired my investigations into the life, works, and times of the committed art photographer, Clarence White, and the exhibition that we celebrate tonight. The story of White's career spans a period of remarkable change from the horse and buggy gilded age of the 1890s to the lost generation and the flappers of the 1920s. It is a period in which Western artistic styles experienced one of the greatest ruptures in history, from mimetic figuration to the abstraction of the isms, cubism, futurism, suprematism, among many other avant-garde groups. Within the medium of photography, there were also major shifts from the use of glass negatives exposed in large view cameras on tripods, a 19th century approach that White never abandoned, to smaller handheld cameras equipped with celluloid strips of film intended to be enlarged. And critical to White's goal, it is a period in which photography succeeded in becoming accepted as a medium of personal artistic expression in its own right rather than merely functioning as, as documentation of something else that was worth preserving, a face, a machine, a current event. 
White took up the camera around 1893 or 1894 as a leisure hours pastime while working as a bookkeeper in a wholesale grocery business in his hometown of Newark, Ohio. And I wanted to show you, if, maybe you're from Ohio, but I wanted to show, this is not in the exhibition, like where is Newark, Ohio? Because the first part of this exhibition is devoted to this period in his career. And this is really the period in which he established his reputation as a photographer. So on the right, you're seeing the canal system in Newark. And uh, Newark is sort of up here in the center, right at the center of Newark, and Randall is nearby. The orbit that he's moving in is the town of Columbus, which is right there. Cincinnati is down here. And then Cleveland uh, is up at the top. Um, so this is really a Midwestern story. And on the left, you're seeing a photograph that he made of this along this canal. Um, this is in the exhibition. Uh, this is his hometown. And this is from the window of his day job of his grocery store. So he's looking out and he's making this amazingly very abstracted and flattened picture um, in 1900. But when, when he started these pictures in the 1890s, he entered into an international community of middle and upper class amateurs, newly attracted to the medium as a result of the greater ease of shooting with pre-sensitized gelatin coated plates that could be exposed dry rather than having to put them in the uh, light sense, to put them in the chemistry immediately before exposure. Throughout the world, these amateurs bonded together to found camera clubs, such as the one that White organized in Newark, Ohio in 1898. Even though George Eastman, 10 years earlier, had introduced an even simpler point-and-shoot camera marketed as the Kodak, White immediately defined himself as a serious rather than a frivolous amateur, and he went for a more expensive 6.5-inch by 8.5-inch view camera. In the next 10 years, White produced an amazingly innovative body of work, peopled by his family and friends, including prominently his wife, Jane, his sister-in-law, Letitia, and you'll see a lot of her in the show, and his two sons, born in 1895 and 1896. One of the striking things about this fertile Newark period, which is, which as I said, is the first part of the exhibition, is that these prints were made by a self-taught photographer with a high school education who prior to 1898 had not been to the East Coast, and he lived in a town of 14,270 people, which was actually at the time considered urban, according to the census, cities, urban was 8,000 people. So it's not such a little tiny town as people tend to think of it. White is thus part of a Midwestern Renaissance during which cultural institutions and museums were being founded in Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, and nearby Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and of course Chicago. And White actually made his first honeymoon trip to Chicago in 1893 for the World's Columbian Exposition. And it was out of that exposition that of course the Art Institute of Chicago moved to its site, uh, the site that it's in today. So the Art Institute had been founded before that, but it was still a kind of new structure. So this is part of museum development in America in the 1890s. White begins exhibiting his photographs with fellow Ohio aspiring art photographers before exhibiting on the East Coast in 1898. That was his first trip east. Within the remarkable span of three years, by 1901, his works were winning prizes in London, Paris, Vienna, and all over Germany. From the outset, White's pictures, despite looking like spontaneous genre scenes, were extremely contrived at every level. And this was one of the great revelations of this exhibition and doing the research for this exhibition, which was to kind of reconstruct and see um, uh, how, how these were contrived. A lot of people look at these pictures and they think, oh, this is what people looked like in the, in the 1890s. But no, these are costume pieces. And actually, these women are wearing dresses that were made by the dressmaker of some of his sitters. And sometimes they were handed down from a previous generation. So, for example, in this picture, this is The Readers, which was one of his early well-known pictures from 1897. And it's his sister-in-law, Letitia Felix, on the left, um, and a high school friend who modeled for him. And uh, not only does he dress them up and very carefully pose them before a window, but what we found by looking at the negatives, because we have the negatives of this collection, which is very unusual for early photography, 
and you, and I, and you can see the extent to which he crops the negatives, that they are radically different and cropped down. You can see on the right, this is a positive scan of this negative. It's not really blue. Uh, and the entire window is closed off to focus you right into these sitters and make it a very intensely beautiful um, study in filtered uh, natural light. In another case, this is a, this is a rare picture in, uh, that is, in fact, related to a painting. Most of White's works, one of the points I wanted to make in the show was that we included paintings in this exhibition um, as kind of comparisons to his work because many people historically have said that this movement in photography was all about imitating painting. And when you start looking at the paintings, you realize that the pictures are very, very different from the paintings. But in this case, there was a painting by William Merritt Chase, who was an extremely successful American artist at this point, called The Ring Toss. Uh, White loosely interprets this painting, but what struck me when I started looking, this is, the, this is one of the versions of the prints. These are made in contact with the negatives. Um, and on the right, um, you're seeing, if you look at this, this is a different negative. This is not the negative for this picture. So what he's done is he's actually made double exposure. He's done different exposure. He's moved over. He's changed the screen to block off the window in the background. So this took time. This is all in a tripod. This is not a snapshot where there's a short time between these. And what's amazing is the extent to which he Without seeing the print, he reconstructs the gestures of these girls almost exactly. He's posing every hand, the girl throwing the ring in the background, um, in the, right here in the center, down to here. You know, her hand's a little different, but he's got, he knows what he wants her to be doing. The other two girls, he's, he, he knows how he wants them to look relaxed, and he's working with these models in, in an amazingly successful way. Um, and he also extremely effectively uses the emptiness of the floor to make it, it an expressive part of the picture. So the plane is very tilted up and the horizon is, is quite high in this picture. Um, the control that White exerted over these photographs is not just in the posing of the pictures and of course the exposure, the camera's bound on a tripod, but he is very much involved in the printing of the pictures. Most of these prints uh, were made in contact with, with the negative on commercially manufactured matte, what was called platinum paper, which was considered by art photographers to be the most beautiful and the most permanent of printing papers at the time. In the late 1890s, White experimented with many types of hand-applied emulsions on papers such as this gum print on the right, which is in, the, these are both in the show, um, where he um, actually hand applies a mixture of gum arabic and a pigment color, which is this kind of sanguine color, plus potassium dichromate, which is sensitive to light. And so he gets a result. This is all from the same negative. So they're very different looking prints. The one on the right looks very much like a chalk drawing. And what you're seeing is totally the process, and you lose all the halftones, um, and you also see the chain lines of this kind of textured paper in this, in this print. We titled this exhibition, The Art and Craft of Photography, not only to signal the care and labor that went into the production of every photographic print, but also to position White's career within the arts and crafts movement. Both the Boston and the Chicago Society of Arts and Crafts which argued for the integration of beautiful design into everyday objects of use, were founded in 1897, at exactly the same time that White starts gaining recognition for his poetic figure studies. So in other words, White is not imitating the arts and crafts movement. He is part of the arts and crafts movement. He's absolutely contemporary with this, with this movement. Until around 1902, White mounted his photographs in frames like this, and dark brown stained wooden panels in keeping with the handmade, honest American aesthetic of the arts and crafts movement. He then clustered them in groups on the wall, as was consistent with salon hangings of paintings in the 19th century. Today, very few turn of the century photographs still exist in their original frames because of changing taste and because of modern museological practices. Uh, but we decided to include a grouping of prints and vintage mounts to give you an idea of how these pictures were displayed. 
And it is important to remember that these prints were intended to be integrated into craftsman style homes next to dark oak uh, sort of stickly uh, style furniture and rookwood pottery. And on the left, I'm just showing you, these are two installation views. Uh, this is the first time that he showed on the East Coast here. And we actually, as it turns out, we actually own some of the objects that you see in some of these installation views, and we put them up in the museum. They've never been seen before. Um, and then the slide on the right, White uh, not only was exhibiting around the world, but he organized exhibitions in his hometown of art photography. And he even invited people like Alfred Stieglitz to send prints who was showing in Newark, Ohio. And so this is his, in the YMCA, YMCA building in Newark, where he put up a show that was up for like about a week, actually. Um, and you can see again some of these same pictures, and these are some of the pictures that you're seeing in our, in our show, are there on the walls. Far from being a mechanical mass-produced object, White and his fellow art photographers believed that photographs should, in the words of William Morris, be lovingly handmade and express the individuality of the human mind and touch, rather than the numbing standardization of machine labor. The world that White constructs in his photographs, particularly during the years that he spent in Ohio prior to his 1906 move to New York City, was a kind of pre-modern utopia, a land of thoughtful individuals, close family ties, healthy uncorseted girls at home with their sexuality, and children learning through the exploration of nature and not confined to rigid classrooms. White's women are never coy or fashionable, and they wear plain clothes and simply dressed hair that don't place them in any particular location or time, such as you see on the left in this very beautiful print called The Lady in Black with Statuette. Even though his figure studies, as I said, were compared with contemporary paintings by successful American artists such as Thomas Dewing or John White Alexander, and on the right I'm showing you an, a sample of Alexander's works that is in the exhibition, again, White's more austere compositions were never as purely sensually decorative as theirs and suggested always that his sitters had interior lives. They, there's this incredible melancholia and a lot of White's women. Probably due to his experience as a father and his sensitivity to the affective message of gestures and gazes, White constructed some of the most beautiful and moving and compositionally daring pictures of childhood for his time. And you see two of these here. Um, on the left, Boy with Camera Work, which was taken after White had become a founding member of the Photo Secession, the group that Alfred Stieglitz had introduced to the public in 1902. In this picture, he radically pushes his son Maynard to the bottom of the frame, grasping an early issue of Camera Work magazine, while seemingly caught in motion from the dining room in the background and then someplace unseen off to the right. The backlit ajar doors with their windows cut off at the top perfectly set off the light mass of the child at the bottom. An even more dramatic use of empty space structures drops of rain, where the real subject seems to be the wonder that a child feels when gazing through a glass globe, like a camera lens, onto a sparkling array of tiny drops frozen for a moment on a screen. And this is the same child, actually. It's his son, Maynard. Rather than shooting from an adult vantage point, White lowers his camera while simultaneously channeling us through the minds of children with their fresh vision, uninhibited expressions of feelings, and ability to live in the present. The same values that underlay White's interest in monumentalizing the simple life, a life not governed by consumerism or outward show, drew him to socialism. Although not an industrial worker, White appreciated calls for fair wages and income redistribution, the collective ownership of public utilities and land, and the imposition of health and environmental regulations. In 1904, the year that White finally quit his bookkeeper's job to become a full-time photographer, he went on a portrait commission to Terre Haute, Indiana, where he met the family of Stephen Reynolds, whom I mentioned earlier, a local lawyer and avid supporter of his neighbor, Eugene Debs who unsuccessfully ran for president on the socialist ticket in 1904, 1908, 1912, and from his jail cell in 1920. Yeah. 
White was overwhelmed by the egalitarian and harmonious lifestyle of the Reynolds family, and he returned over several years to photograph them. And I'm just showing you on the left one of this series. These are two of the Reynolds uh, daughters uh, in a kind of very, very pre-Raphaelitic um, sort of staged embrace in the Reynolds home in Terre Haute. He loved this family. He raised about them endlessly. Through Reynolds, White was introduced to Rose Pastor Stokes, a former immigrant laborer and outspoken journalist who married into one of America's most affluent families and joined with her husband, Graham Stokes, to organize collegiate socialist groups and advocate for strikers and the party. White visited the Stokeses at their summer home on Caritas Island, Connecticut, and portrayed Rose as a heroic free spirit facing the open sea just months before she would join in the ladies' garment workers' strike in New York. And often, Rose was often um, arrested. And uh, this becomes the cover of our catalog, which I thought was kind of great. Um, so um, this, is, this is his foray into yet another sort of socialist connection that he, that he pursues. And he did know this family. White not only shared these socialist defenses of the rights of workers over capital, but he embraced their liberal social thought. The writings of Walt Whitman and the British philosopher and socialist Edward Carpenter, both champions of the common man, found receptive audiences among many American educated socialists. White's lifelong commitment to the photography of the nude, whether young boys or adult female models, was informed by his rejection of puritanical campaigns to outlaw such depictions as obscene. He befriended the Boston art photographer Fred Holland Day, whom you see on the left, in 1898. And then in, in 1905, he visited Day's summer house near Georgetown, Maine, where Day ran a sort of fresh air camp for underprivileged Boston immigrant children and local invited guests. White and Day together and separately photographed the younger boys in a state of pagan nudity on the right, as you see, um, as if they were Spartans exercising in the woods. White appreciated Day's philanthropic activities and the return to the healthy integration of the nude body into nature that many doctors and progressive social thinkers at the time had become advocating as a cure for neurasthenia and urban noise and congestion. A pivotal point in White's career was his move, as I said, suggested his move from Ohio to New York in 1906. After his first trip to Philadelphia in 1898 to see his works in the first Philadelphia Salon, he repeatedly visited the East Coast, and he strengthened his ties with Alfred Stieglitz. When Stieglitz formed the Photo Secession in 1902, began publishing that luxuriously illustrated magazine camera work that you just saw in the portrait of White's son in 1903, and then subsequently opened a gallery to exhibit art photography in 1905 on Fifth Avenue, White became a member of the inner circle of the secessionist. The departure of Edward Steichen uh, to Paris, Steichen who had been helping uh, Stieglitz with his publications and exhibitions, Steichen goes to France in 1906, and I think this prompted White uh, to think that maybe he could substitute and take Steichen's position at 291. And so that's the moment when he moves to the city. And this was a very problematic um, move for him. Um, for many, many reasons. Not only did he lose the female models who had populated his Newark photographs, but he lost the idyllic hills and country orchards and rivers that had formed the backdrops of many of his pictures. What's interesting is White never photographed on the streets of Manhattan, and his landscapes were made during the summers at F. Holland Day's home in Maine, or on trips out from the city. Studio portraiture, um, either of his fellow photographers in New York or increasingly of paid sitters, assumed a much larger role in his career. As a portraitist, he excelled in depicting the inner character of his models and in the use of raking light uh, to sculpt forms. And here, this is in the show, um, this is a really kind of interesting comparison of portraits that he made of Stieglitz right after he does move to New York. On the right, you're seeing a contact print. This is called a cyanotype. This was a proofing print medium. These prints were never shown in these art photography exhibitions. Uh, but I'm using it here to kind of symbolize the negative. This is what the negative would have looked like if you printed it in contact. And here you're seeing on the left the finished print 
uh, that he made from this negative. And again, this is a big lesson that I'm, I learned from this exhibition, which is the degree to which he completely transforms the negatives in the printing process. So he erases the entirety of the coat, the sleeve, he completely adjusts the background to halo, kind of reduce the light and make it into a halo around the head of the sitter. He also extends the paper beyond the size of the negative. So this is, the negative actually comes, it stops at the same scale, and the rest of this is just paper that's been directly exposed to the light. So again, printing is completely trans transformative. White uses a similar effect in one of the over 60 prints of two beautiful young women that he made with Stieglitz over the course of 1907. This series marked the first time that Alfred Stieglitz had really explored in depth the posing of the nude and the closest moment of collaboration between the two men. After White and Stieglitz had a huge rupture in 1912, the photographs that were produced were famously mostly returned to White, with Stieglitz demanding that they never again be exhibited under his name. This exhibition is the first time that a small selection of these prints have been reunited. A serialized study of a female body that Stieglitz would only take up again the next time that Stieglitz did pictures like this was in 1918, and the model was Georgia O'Keeffe. So this is the first time that he really exposed um, and worked with the nude model, which was something that White had actually done uh, for many, many years. Another important transformation that the move to New York affected was White's new role as a teacher. In 1907, Stieglitz passed on to White the news that the uh, Columbia Teachers College, the Fine Arts Department of the Teachers College of Columbia, excuse me, <clears throat> wanted to hire a part-time instructor to teach a class in studio photography. Um, this is kind of hard for us to appreciate because we take for granted that universities and schools teach photography, but at, at this point in history, that was not being done. Um, and there, you know, so this was a kind of unusual move. And furthermore, um, White was teaching art photography. There were places where people had, could take courses in technical darkroom photography with not very much aesthetic component. For, exa for example, at the same time, um, Edward Weston goes to the Illinois College of Photography to learn photography. And that was a technical school. It wasn't really emphasizing um, composition. So White started with this one class at Columbia. Things kind of, you know, it, things expanded. And little did he know at the outset that teaching was going to become another major way that uh, his reputation was um, established. And he, you know, he, he, he must have been very good at it because he, had, he really has, had a huge loyal following among his students. He expands his courses. Um, he starts teaching at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences right away. And then in 1910, uh, for the first time, he founded a summer school at F. Holland Day's house in Maine. And again, this was kind of a new thing to have a photographic summer school. So this is a very fuzzy scene on the left, but um, this picture's in the show. It looks better than this in the show. Uh, but this is actually kind of what it was like to be at this main summer school um, where he invited different people. F. Holland Day came over and did crits. Uh, this is the school in 1913. They had an improvised little dark room out here. Um, and the, the woman here in the center, this is Gertrude Kazevere, who herself is a very famous art. Uh, photographer and the guy in the in the in the sailor suit in the in the center is that's F, that's uh, that's Clarence White. They 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 wore these sailor suits um, in the main school <laughs> to keep. They said it was to keep their good clothes from getting messed up. So that was that was the rationale. But. Anyway, this camp-like school um, actually moves to Canaan, Connecticut, and the school continues. The summer school continues until 1925. Uh, the other thing that happens this is kind of a series of things is. In 1914, um, he founds a full-time photo school in New York. And again, this was a major step for him. So a large part of our exhibition is, is devoted to White as a teacher. Um, and on the right, the first location of this school was down near St. Mark's in the Bowery, which was a really lousy neighborhood at, at the time. Um, and uh, I think this photograph was taken in the, in the back of that school building uh, and this shows you his students. His students were not little undergraduate students. His students were adult students, and most of them were from, most of the women had gone to Seven Sisters schools. They had BAs. They were advanced students. 
Here you see this is uh, White seated, he's squatting in the foreground here, and then right on top of him is one of the teachers who taught darkroom photography. This is a man named Paul Anderson. And then the guy next to the railing, uh, this is the artist uh, Max Weber, who uh, taught composition and taught art history at the White School between 1914 and 1918. So we're into this school here. Um, White developed, a, you know, it's interesting, White never took a photo class. He never took an art class, but he becomes a huge teacher. Um, so he developed a curriculum in which a lot of attention was given to principles of two-dimensional composition. Um, the goal was always art photography. And um, what you're seeing here, the, the range of work, um, the, the students did portraits, they, they had, I've included in the show samples of some of the assignments that were given at the school, um, in many cases. They were working with light, and light is always a very, very creative variable in his pictures. This is a fairly early school picture with a very pronounced Japanese-Asian aesthetic, a Japanese vase, a kind of uh, maybe Chinese scroll, oriental furniture, and then a sort of odd uh, manuscript that's tossed down here in the foreground. But the point was to do a sort of lesson in composition. You arranged elements within the frame, and then you worked with this, uh, this direct light and cast shadows. What made White successful as a teacher was his investment in developing the person, not merely the photographer. He supplemented his classes with invited lectures by picture editors, newspaper publishers, scientists, fine artists. He brought in a Japanese Ikebana teacher to help his students to be sensitive to beautiful flower arranging. He had a physical education and dance teacher named Bird Larson who introduced physical culture and kind of PE classes at Barnard College. And she gave lessons to his students on rhythmic breathing um, to help them be more relaxed and fulfilled. This happened in the school. He enlisted the printer, Frederick Gowdy, to teach the students about typefaces and print picture coordination. In 1925, he took a small group of these students to Mexico, which was, ironically, his first trip out of the United States. He never went to Europe. So he goes to Mexico. He'd been briefly in Toronto. And then on that trip, he had, after about a week, an aortic aneurysm and died. Um, as Stieglitz later wrote, he died in harness. He died as a teacher. So just prior to that trip, I, I, there, there, the school curriculum changes through time, just as photography changes enormously between 1914 and then after the war. So the school is going to modernize um, a great deal um, and kind of adapt to changing photo technology. Some of his students did start using smaller format cameras. His students after the war did start using what we call gelatin silver paper, coated paper like what you think of today as black and white paper. Um, and he, uh, many of them, um, did go into advertising. White was very interested in placing them in positions. He had a huge success rate. Um, so his students became, um, one of them works as the photographer at the Frick Reference Library. Many of them went into advertising or fashion photography. Some of them ran portrait studios. And again, a lot of them were women. Margaret Watkins on the right is one of his well-known students. She's had a kind of revival with feminist art history recently. And uh, this picture was reproduced in Vanity Fair magazine in 1919, and it's, uh, excuse me, not 1919, in 21, I think. And it is a picture, it shows also the kind of hybridity between photographs that were intended to be compositional studies focused on individual objects and studies in, you know, form versus advertising photography. Those two uh, types of photography were absolutely, modernism overlaps completely with the rhetoric of advertising because advertisers discover the close-up and they want to show you the isolated forms. And so Watkins moves seamlessly from the White School um, into advertising photography. White was also a huge organizer and he picks up the mantle that is dropped by Alfred Stieglitz because Stieglitz, if you know anything about his career, got out of the photo business pretty much about 1910. He quits showing photography at the 291 Gallery, and people complained about this. And so White, after he breaks with Stieglitz in 1912, in 1913, he starts his own magazine because camera work was not really reproducing photographs anymore. Camera work was reproducing painting, was reproducing European modernism. 
So he founds a magazine called Platinum Print because it was devoted to this kind of platinum paper. And that magazine um, is later retitled Photographic Art to emphasize the relationship between photography and the graphic arts. White also, uh, since Stieglitz wasn't really doing this anymore, uh, he founded his own group. The photo secession kind of dies after 1910. Uh, so Stieglitz found a, founds a group called Pictorial Photographers of America, uh, which still exists uh, today, actually. He was president of that and one of the founders of that group. Through his membership in a social club called the Stowaways, which consisted of art directors, advertising artists, and publishers, and also through his position as an administrator at a, a place called the Art Center in New York, which was a collective organization that housed a number of the Society of Illustrators, uh, a lot of applied artist groups. They were really, again, promoting the applied arts. Um, White networked through these organizations and through his uh, leadership roles in these organizations to, again, place his students in advertising and publishing um, agencies. Another aspect that came out in the course of this research that we didn't know about White was that he was, all along he is selling to magazines. Almost all the pictorial <laughs> photographers, these art photographers, were selling to magazines because you could not make money selling art photographs. There was really no market. Most of these people sold to one another. So uh, there's a huge, you know, you made money selling to magazines and, and doing book illustration. Um, but White did fashion photography, and we, we never knew that. And, um, and it's actually, he's quite good as a fashion photographer. Um, the pictures, I'm sure there's more pictures out there that I haven't found uh, if I went through every magazine in America. Uh, <laughs> there are limits. Uh, but uh, I did find these pictures in Woman's Home Companion where just the very month that he dies, this picture was reproduced in the magazine in the July issue um, of uh, an ad for a Bonwit uh, Teller uh, costume uh, of a girl getting into a train. And I think that his, his experience working with female models in natural light out of doors made him very, very, he could have been, he could have been a contender uh, as, a, as a fashion photographer, but he, you know, he dies, and so it doesn't happen. So it's a very naturalistic picture, and fashion photography did not really look like this by 25. It's going to take off a little bit later in terms of outdoor photography. Most fashion photographer, photography was studio photography at this point. And this is just another page of this same spread um, in Woman's Home Companion, another on, in C2 kind of uh, fashion picture that he shot. The career of Clarence White started with what I would call slow photography, multi-second exposure times with cameras on tripods, complex manipulation of printing papers, and the production of unique artistic objects that belie the commonplace idea that photography is a mechanically reproductive medium. Although White eventually accepted and taught the new sharper focus aesthetic and the use of higher contrast gels and silver papers, he never gave up the view camera and he never tried personally the 35 millimeter roll film cameras such as the Leica that was introduced um, commercially in 1919. He continued to believe in all people's creative potential, and his teaching was dedicated to awakening his students to the beauty of everyday sights, shadows cast on an urban wall, diagonals seen through a doorway, hands peeling an apple. I invite you to visit the exhibition and engage in some slow looking to discover the refined vision of a self-made man from the American heartland one committed to the idea that crafting photographs could improve the world and at the same time, the people who made them. Thank you. Okay. So if anybody is a glutton for punishment and wants to know more about Clarence White, um, I'm open to taking some questions from the floor if you want to just shout them out, because we don't have a handheld mic here. I have a mic. Oh, you do? I take that back. We do have a handheld mic. Do you want to up the lights, or maybe we could up the lights? Is anybody up there? Yes. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You never really wanted to make the move toward uh, oh, sorry. You never wanted to make the move toward uh, you know uh, super sharp uh, photography, which of course you can do it with your camera, as you well know. Yeah, um, his pictures do, it depends, okay, there's a, I, at the end of this exhibition I show some of his later commercial work, and he was perfectly capable of doing sharper pictures, and sometimes depending on the function of the picture, they would be sharper. In fact, when he was hired, he did a lot of frontispieces frontis for uh, a number of publications, and he does a, a portrait of Abbot Thayer, the painter, which was supposed to be for an exhibition catalog, and John Beatty, who was the director, um, of the Carnegie Museum at that point told him he wanted a sharp, glossy picture, which White delivered to him. So, and if he knew the picture was for, at least late by the time he's doing the fashion, but the fashion pictures are sharper. If he knew the picture was for reproduction in a magazine, it would often be printed on a different paper and it would be higher contrast because platinum prints lose an incredible amount of contrast in, in the, a lot of the printing media. And he discovered that early on when he did book illustrations, that the reproductions looked terrible because he gave them platinum prints to reproduce, which are very, very low contrast prints. And so um, there's a range of focus. Um, he did, uh, also I didn't talk about, he did use the soft focus lenses, which were very popular, which could, on purpose, I mean, to get this soft focus. Um, he had a range of lenses. He never really bought new equipment. He, he really, he had a couple of cameras. He used the same old stuff. It's like Stieglitz. Stieglitz really had a little, you know, Stieglitz never made an enlargement with uh, <laughs> their contact printed prints. Um, White did do some enlargements, but he had, to do an enlargement in this point in history, uh, using the papers that he was using, you had to make an account, an account, an internegative, which is a larger negative and contact, contact print from that. Um, but mostly his pictures remained contact prints and they remained, he used platinum as long as he could and then after World War I, when platinum paper gets uh, super expensive and unavailable, he, takes, he shifts to palladium <coughs> paper. And I forgot to think, there, in the group here, there's a group of students from Yale that came down here and um, with Paul Messier uh, helped us to analyze, uh, use what's called, what's called x-ray fluorescence to analyze White's papers to figure out whether they, when they were done, what, when these prints were made, whether they were platinum or palladium. That's, so, yes? Is there a technical reason why platinum and palladium prints don't have the dynamic range that uh, the modern silver printer, I guess it is? Is Paul out there? <laughs> he can answer this question. Are you here? Um, I mean, there is a, you know, platinum, it, it's a totally different, the, the platinum cells are in the, and the palladium cells are in the surface of the paper, and you're just not, it's, it's a totally different structure of the paper. You're not gonna, like, the darkest dark, you can get a kind of charcoal gray, but you're not gonna get this sort of tonal range. Do you wanna answer that at all, Paul? No? Okay, <laughs> he's not gonna say anything. We, we have a concern, con you know, I am not a professional photographic scientist, but we have some of those people in the room here, so. Um, yeah, because plat platinum paper, the trouble with what was called bromide paper, which was you could enlarge onto this other coated paper, bromide paper, but at the time it was very impermanent. And so if you wanted to make serious art photography, you printed in platinum because it was felt that platinum would not change. It wouldn't fade or discolor. So that's, and the prints were also part of the aesthetic of the, of the moment. They were very subtle half tones, very delicate. Um, which was kind of consistent with the, um, what high art painting and printmaking um, looked like at the time. Yes? Could you put this into some sort of context in comparing it to Europe in terms of what was occurring in France, Germany, Ooh. and the new Soviet Union? Ah, oh, the Soviet Union, oh my God. Um, I mean, there is, okay, I mean, I'm gonna put it into the context of international pictorialism because of pick this, the, the thing that I think people, it's hard for us to imagine that there were all these normal people like, like us in the room here, you know, who went out and took the trouble to assert that we were making art photography and that we organized all these exhibitions. There's like an, it's like a fad. It was really a hugely fashionable thing to do. And people did this all over the world. And so, and then they exchanged prints and they shipped these pictures all over the, Euro, the world from the US to London, the linked ring, Paris and eventually even into Japan. Some of the white school students actually ship by 1924. They're, sh they're exhibiting in, to, in uh, Japan. Um, and so the style, this sort of art 
style, which unfortunately gets kind of ghettoized as soft focus. They're, not everything that is in this movement is soft focus. There's a range of focus. But it was a very international style, and there's a kind of a bit of a lag, so that it, even in the Soviet Union, um, there is a pictorial photography movement at the same time that you're having <coughs> Rodchenko and Lizitsky. In other words, it is coexisting with these modernist movements, which in fact were normally not organized and led by photographers. People like Mahali Naj, who takes up photography, is a painter. Um, that's a whole other story. It's like the whole history of the 1920s, but, but you have to, there's many, many kind of parallel stylistic movements in any given country at any time. And so just as white, you know, pictures in America are getting more sharp focus in the 20, but in the 1920s, but it's really a mistake to think that, you know, Edward Weston in 1920 actually looks like this. You know, he is in this pictorial movement. His pictures are very soft focus. He's printing on platinum, and then he's going, things are going to change in the course of the 1920s fairly rapidly. Like by 1925, things have changed. Yes, who's uh, in the back? Whoops. You know, Newark, Ohio, where he came from. I mean, what was the influence that caused him to do this? Because it almost sounds like he went into it right away doing an artistic type of uh, amateur photography. You know, he came out of, uh, just in terms of his social class, I mean, okay, graduating high school was kind of a big deal in those days. It's like college today. Most people did not graduate from high school. Um, in 1891 or whenever he graduates. So he was in this sort of genteel class in Newark and most of, many of his friends did even go to university. Um, these were the same people. He was an amateur, he studied violin, he was cultured, they went to local concerts in, uh, in, in Granville and Denison College was right there and we know that he was over there. Um, so I think he's, what I said about a, a kind of Midwestern Renaissance, I think this is a time um, where we've kind of, it's like looking at what's happened in the Midwest is quite tragic, but it was a moment where Americans were very, very hopeful about culture and cultural uplift in America and there's an incredible civic responsibility and people are, as I said, founding local symphony orchestras in these small towns, founding libraries, you have the Carnegie libraries that are being founded. So, so that's kind of the context. It wasn't so strange for someone who was staunchly kind of middle class um, to, to want to improve uh, him or herself. And again, there were a lot of even women in Newark who become amateur photographers. Yes. Considering the treatment for the negatives, should autobiographical images of this period be termed jelpies? <laughs> <laughs> Would you repeat that? Wait, what? <laughs> I think I missed that. Oh, jelpies. They should be called platties, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh my God, well, do you have an hour? Uh, uh, Alfred Stieglitz broke with almost everybody in the photo secession. He was, um, uh, if you, I mean, he, he was a notoriously uh, controlling person, I would say, and uh, he had very, obviously, strong personality. Um, he, I mean, he was, he also was very different. You know, Clarence White, he, it was horrible when Clarence White died. He wrote a kind of snide letter um, to Heinrich Kuhn, who was a German photographer friend of his, and he said, Clarence White, and he wrote in German, he said, Clarence White will always be a, a Kleinstatter, small town person. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, because Stieglitz had this very cosmopolitan, and he, you know, he, he, he had a lot of money, he never had to work. Um, he was very educated. He went and studied in Germany. He'd been all over Europe. He went to Europe a million times. Clarence White never went to Europe. He's like from the Midwest. He was kind of this podunky guy in uh, Stieglitz society. That's not why they split, though, but there was a sort of difference. Um, they split over something petty. People always split over petty stuff with Stieglitz, and it had to do with returning prints from the Buffalo show because Stieglitz organized all of these exhibitions and he kind of masterminded the transport. So he had pictures that there was a big show in 1910 at the Albright Art Galleries, now the Albright Knox. And um, it was kind of a high point of the photo secession. So Stieglitz was controlling, I and mean, he even bought the glass for that. He was really controlling that installation. And he kept all the prints. And so uh, several years later, White complained. He said, like, I'm sorry, I'm looking for these prints. I need them. And Stieglitz blew up and said, 
I'm not your secretary. Like, <laughs> where are your prints? And you're like, well, I'm not responsible. And this is the photo secession, and it's the organization, and I am not the photo secession. And there are these letters that go back and forth, and they're extremely nasty. And then uh, Stiglitz says, OK, take your prints, but take everything that I ever did together, and I'm giving to you, and I never want to see with my name on it again. And that was it, basta. And so uh, they did reconcile a little bit in the 20s as the photo secession became history. Um, uh, White invited Stieglitz to lecture um, for the school for, at, the, at the Arts Center. So, um, so they did have a little bit of a rapprochement in the end. But Stieglitz split with Gertrude Kasebeer, he split with Alvin Langdon Coburn, he split with Max Weber, he, you know, the, the, it keeps going on. So. Yes? that there's a quarter there. Oh, yes. Right. So, um, you know, given White's um, sort of social leanings, um, did he take pictures of people of color or different ethnicities? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that. Um, yes, the, but not very often. I mean, that's actually not that exceptional for the period. Um, yes, he, well, F. Holland, it's a very complicated story, but F. Holland Day, um, who has suffered a great deal at the hands of, um, recent scholars um, for his sexualization of black sitters, but F. Holland Day actually was very much into social uplift, was, gave lectures at the Hampton Institute, um, which is the big kind of uh, uh, school for uh, African-American children, oh, they were, they were adolescents, African-Americans and uh, Native American children, um, went down there actually before he goes up to White's house and um, was sympathetic, takes them as sitters. White did not shoot African Americans in Ohio. I don't know who was there, but he didn't shoot. But then when he comes to New York, he, he, he takes one picture, two pictures, through the Reynolds family that are in the Reynolds album. And I unfortunately didn't open it to that page in the show. And they're of a black, I don't know who the woman is. She's an African American woman. And I think within the Reynolds household, they were very, very, we call them very high liberal, very, very left. And they believed in, in social equality and they invited African Americans. They obviously, I think she was a member of the family. And there's a picture of the Reynolds children shaking hands with this, with this black sitter and White made that picture. And then he takes a close up of this black woman. And he goes to uh, do a job at the Jamestown Exposition in 1907. And he writes F. Holland Day about seeing the, the black Virginia, seeing this kind of Williams, visiting Williamsburg and how moved he was by seeing the black workers there. But he didn't take pictures as far as I know on that trip. But you know, yes. One more, one more question that we have to go. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about White's relationship with Steichen and Kasevier? Oh, I can't cover both of those in one minute, but um, <laughs> he is very, okay, Steichen is complicated initially, it is White who is the person who recommends and introduces Steichen to Stieglitz. So the famous trip when Steichen is from Milwaukee and he goes to New York and he's moving to Paris in 1900 and he stops in to see Stieglitz in New York. It was White who wrote a letter and said, you should see this guy. Um, he met him in Chicago at the Chicago 1900 exposition, uh, uh, the pictorial uh, exhibition. And so that was the introduction between Stieglitz and Steichen and then you're going to see in the exhibition, um, when Steichen comes back from France in 1902 for the first time, and he gets married, and on his honeymoon in 1903, he visits the Whites. And so we have this great photograph of Steichen lying on the ground in White's living room um, on that 1903 trip. And they stayed quite friends until Steichen, I think, goes back to France um, in 1906. But, um, in many ways, Steichen was the rival to White in Stieglitz's affections. Stieglitz, Stieglitz played favorites, and he liked to have these um, younger men that he nurtured. And so uh, it was Steichen who, who won out and became very close to Stieglitz. And then he sort of, once White splits with Stieglitz, he's already split with Steichen. Steichen is going to split with Stieglitz, famously, when the war breaks out, and he joins in 1917. And that was the end of the era. Well, they had a big rupture over the, over the war. So uh, Kasebeer was an extremely good friend of White's forever. She was one of his staunchest friends from the time she met him in 1898 at the first Philadelphia exhibition of art photography where Stieglitz was a judge through the, whole, through the teens. And uh, so she's, she's, she's there through the whole history of the pictorial photographers of America. 
All right, thank you so much.